while we're waiting for I think a few more to come in, um, thank you all for joining. I see a lot of familiar faces or names or screens. It's good to have everybody join us virtually in this historic time. Um, a lot of you know Carl Lounsbury. Carl has served on our board several terms. He's currently an advisor to, uh, to the foundation. And if you're familiar with Carl's work, you know he had a long history at Colonial Williamsburg, over 30 years in the Department of Architectural Research there. He's published, Nat and I were just talking, he's published some important works on Colonial Virginia and architecture in South Carolina. He wrote a book about the South Carolina colonial capital and Charleston County Courthouse. One of my favorite works is his illustrated glossary of early Southern architecture and landscape, which I confess, Carl never made it out of my office when you donated it to uh, Historic <laughs> Christ Church. So Sorry. I've appropriated it. Sorry. It's a um, great, great book. It's a really an awesome glossary of, of terms you encounter in landscapes and buildings across, across the South. Uh, he also, I can see on my desk, the courthouses of early Virginia, which is a great, great work. And so we're thrilled to have Carl. He's done a lot of uh, research on churches, courthouses, all kinds of buildings in Virginia, but he's been part of the uh, excavations and research at Jamestown with some of the churches that they uncovered, uh, I guess the 1608 church and some of the 1617 findings. So we're thrilled to have him and um, I'm going to turn it over to Carl and let him walk us through this presentation. Okay, well, thank you, Robert, uh, for the introduction. It's nice to see faces. Uh, however, we're separated. Uh, it's, it's good to see names, too. Uh, this is a very strange kind of uh, um, way of dealing with uh, communicating. I know that. Uh, I just saw yesterday, and many of you probably saw uh, in the news or a clip that uh, uh, a Zoom meeting in court, the lawyer turned up as a cat. Uh, he, someone had turned on a cat um, app and they couldn't, couldn't yet, yeah, and he explained he was not a cat. Um, so I'm sure that's the first time in court that a lawyer had to argue against himself about his, um, his skills. Uh, anyway, um, I'm going to talk to you today about the, um, uh, the, Architecture of the Anglican Church in Virginia in the 17th century. Um, I've done this before, and I was just thinking last night uh, how much has been done in the past decade. Uh, we've been able to fill in the gaps on many different aspects of um, Anglican Church architecture in Virginia, which is it's sort of like the as you'll see, it's sort of a dark hole in, in many decades. We don't have any information about what was going on here in Virginia, basically after the uh, Virginia Company's uh, uh, charter was revoked and it became a crown colony. Uh, basically all that, um, that secretary's note taking sent back and forth to, uh, to London, to the London Company or the Virginia Company uh, disappeared. And, uh, it's just amazing how little we know um, because actually, unfortunately, because Virginians didn't keep very good records. Uh, they were very cavalier about them. I guess that's the right term. Uh, they, they let, uh, when I was doing my courthouse research, I would, do recall looking at early court record books and uh, down the corners and, and actually along the edges, you can see teeth marks uh, from rats uh, gnawing away at the old court record books. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember one, one county, uh, they, um, they um, investigated the condition of the, of the clerk's office and they said it was uh, Matt, uh, the, the, the records were in terrible shape, much gnawed and ratified. <laughs> in other words, the rats are eating away at it. And I'm afraid they got hold of both the records and as well as the buildings in, uh, uh, for the churches. So there's not a lot we knew. And, and 10 years ago, there were still big gaps, even at the beginning, because we had not discovered uh, the 1608 church at Jamestown. Uh, the 1617 churches, <clears throat> you'll see, had been discovered, but not very well 
understood and there's still confusion about the brick church at Jamestown as well. And outside of um, Jamestown, there was very, very little to talk about. Um, but since that time, uh, we've excavated at Jamestown. Uh, we've also done dendrochronology at St. Luke's Church um, called Newport Parish Church at the time. It's no longer 1632, but dates to sometime after the 1670s, um, which is more reasonable, as you'll see. Um, and uh, we started looking for those other churches throughout in the countryside. Uh, and I welcome any new archaeological research. So I've been doing church research for more than 30 years. I have, uh, I'm writing a book on early churches in America, all denominations from uh, Maine to Georgia. And as you can, <clears throat> that's why it takes so long. And uh, I think it, in some ways it pays not to rush into print because uh, if I'd written this thing 10 years ago, we would have a lot less knowledge about what was going on in early Virginia as well as other places. So I'm gonna try to bring up the um, shared screen. This is always the, the hard part here. Oops. All right, can people see this? Robert, can you everyone see this? Uh, I can see it, yes. Hello? Uh, can you hear me, Carl? Okay, I, yeah, I just, yeah, I, I, can I, see I, it. I, I teach a class at William and Mary online, and I think one, one week I heard some snoring going on because I can't see all the faces, and so. <laughs> I knew they were deeply involved in the in my presentation, so if I hear any snoring, I'll I'll, I'll stop. Anyway, I'll so, stop. yeah, uh, it's also very interesting to place the early uh, Anglican Church in Virginia in a, in a timeline, and and to know that in 1607. The, um, the Reformation that just simply transformed England in many ways uh, was still, and I won't say it's fresh knowledge, but it's certainly within the memory of some of the older people of, of, to ex have experienced those Henrican reforms and then the, the, just the tumultuous middle of the uh, 16th century when first Edward VII, uh, Edward VI, uh, Henry's son, really turned England into a Protestant nation, and then it was completely put in reverse by his elder half-sister Mary in the 1550s, and then uh, her half-sister uh, Elizabeth put it back in the opposite direction. So there were a lot of jolting going on and around, so things really didn't get settled down. Uh, not even in 1607, there's still ramifications of just how thorough the Reformation was going to be. Uh, but it was moving swiftly into being a uh, Reformed nation. But just what the Anglican Church was was still up for debate uh, between different factions of the um, Anglican Church. There was, uh, in the early 17th century, there's some, there's a group called the High Church uh, uh, led by a guy named Archbishop Laud. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury, appointed by Charles I who wanted to put some of the older traditional ceremonies uh, that had been uh, swept away by the reforms of Edward VI uh, in the 15, uh, 1540s and early 50s. And then there were a new group around, uh, really that, that emerged as a distinctive group called the Puritans, uh, derisively called the Puritans, who wanted to purify the church of all those, what they called superstitious um, um, ceremonies and lingering uh, links to uh, the old unreformed Catholic Church. Uh, and they would they did battle mainly through pamphlets first in the 1570s, 80s, and 90s, uh, and then eventually uh, broke out into uh, open warfare by the 16, uh, late 30s and really, in the start of the English Civil War in 1642. So Virginians were, were caught up in this. They, they, we, it's hard to tell exactly what kind of 
uh, faith most Virginians had because they didn't write, they didn't, their diaries had disappeared and they didn't write down very much. There's just some fragmentary information about what Virginians were thinking about in this, this great struggle for what the Anglican Church was going to be. Um, but what it was, uh, without any doubt, it was a, re a Reformed Church. It just, it, the question is how, how much further the Reform was going to go on. And a Reformed Church basically uh, consisted of rethinking the nature of worship services in a church. Uh, in the old days, in the pre-Reformed Church, the, the sort of the pinnacle of, the, of the, the Mass, the Catholic Mass, was when the priest raised the, um, the Eucharist, and, and at the Eucharist, when he raised the, the, um, the, the paten in the, in the cup uh, to celebrate this miracle of transformation of Jesus' body and, and blood into the wine, the bread and wine into his body. So it was, a, uh, it was a miracle that took place inside the church every time Mass was said. Well, the reformers said that we're not going to have any of that. Instead, we want to hear about instructive uh, ways of being Christians as well as uh, commemorating the Last Supper as a, uh, as, a, as, as a communion as opposed to a miracle that took place. So they redefined what the Last Supper was all about. And so they really needed just basically two um, places in the church. One is a pulpit so that the preacher could preach the word of God because the Bible became the source of authority uh, for the church. Anything that was not in the Bible was, was suspect. For example, uh, there's nothing in the Bible about the structure of the Anglican church with bishops. And uh, many of the Puritans wanted to do away with, with the bishops uh, completely, which they did during the English Civil War. Um, so there was a little bit of church ceremony, but they were also suspect of things like music, uh, uh, robes and, and, and copes and things like that that just didn't seem to be part of the biblical um, uh, tradition, nor certain uh, basic um, ceremonies and, and, and doctrines such as transubstantiation or purgatory and a lot of these other things that they could not find evidence for in the Bible, and so they wanted to get rid of these things. But a church in the Reformed Church basically was all about preaching the Word of God. So they needed a place to uh, a place in the center of the church for the preacher to preach the Word of God. A pulpit. There were pulpits in the in the um, in the pre-Reformed Church, but not that many, and they were only used uh, periodically. But um, a central place, so the pulpit became the centerpiece were all preaching and um, became the way of organizing the church. And secondarily, they needed a place for communion. And, so, and there, there were big battles about where to put the communion table. Uh, it ended up with Archbishop Laud at the east end of the church, but many of the Elizabethan and, and Jacobean uh, Puritan ministers wanted to have the, the communion table right there below the pulpit in the center of the church. So there were always struggles about where that should be. But basically they needed these two places to uh, celebrate uh, worship, holy worship every Sunday. Um, here you see in these images uh, a, a pulpit placed up high uh, so everyone could be uh, seated around it. And so chairs or benches or pews started to come into fashion. Whereas before there was little seating, there's some, uh, in some churches, but generally uh, seating became a, nece a necessity. And you can see the minister administering um, <clears throat> Holy Communion to people coming around. And in that debate about how to conduct that continued to, to be worked out uh, well into the 1630s and 40s. So right at the time that Virginia was settled at Jamestown, these things were not set in stone. There were still debates about all of these things in two extremes. So we always should keep that in mind. And I, I wouldn't be surprised as, as they uh, seem to be at Jamestown when they keep coming across what they find as uh, Catholic icons and things like that. So there might might have been some people who still worship the old church but tried to keep it secret. 
Uh, the other one, other aspect, especially among the uh, more Calvinist influence uh, members of the Puritan wing of the church, was uh, a um, great concern about having uh, icons, uh, things that were definitely what they saw was proscribed by uh, by the Ten Commandments, the second one, about having graven images. And so there was this fury that went on, uh, sort of like the Taliban in, in modern times in different, different uh, circumstances, but nonetheless as, as, as destructive as, 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 as anything. Uh, there are these, these moments of rage, especially in Holland and in throughout Germany and parts of France, uh, of tearing down the old uh, statues and, and believing that these were things that uh, people worshipped instead of uh, the spirit of God. Uh, and you can see in, in, uh, in the great um, Anglican Protestant uh, books here, such as the Book of Martyrs by Fox, what uh, the church meant. It means purifying the church, getting rid of these icons, monuments, paintings, and all these sort of things. So you can see still in many English churches uh, evidence. Uh, for example, here, uh, this old uh, um, screen where the many of the saints were located, you can see that they were actually defaced, scratched out. Or here at this font, you can see the heads of Jesus or of God or, uh, being knocked off as being uh, superstitious as well as prohibited. And you can, so when you go into many old English churches, you can actually see the impact of the, of the Reformation, particularly in the 1540s and early 50s under Edward, and then again in the 1640s under the Puritans during the Civil War, uh, a deliberate destruction of these ancient uh, images. Uh, this is, uh, I thought, find this very, uh, for those who can't imagine what a church was like pre and post um, Reformation, here's a sketch of a, uh, of a, a priory that was converted into a, um, in a parish church. And you can see on the left, uh, it's, you know, it's filled with color. It's got images, uh, biblical images, uh, everything's painted. And then you can see everything was whitewashed and, and blocked out uh, afterwards. So it must have been an aesthetic transformation that it's hard for us to fathom these days. Um, there were among some of the more um, uh, extremist of the Puritan wing, there were those who uh, advocated the destruction of old churches as being uh, polluted by the old, the old faith. Uh, fortunately, very few uh, adhered to that, and so the, the, these buildings were uh, cleaned out of their uh, what they called pap papal iconography, but uh, nonetheless they were reused in different ways than they had been. These are just a few parish churches in, in an area around um, in, in, in part of England that I've done a lot of research on, and you can see but most of them are divided into two sections. There is, uh, one section is the body of the church, and then sometimes even larger is the, uh, the eastern end, which was the, the, what was called the chancel. And uh, sometimes the chancels were abandoned completely because the, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the communion table was moved into the body of the church. Uh, other times it was, it, it was uh, reworked and, and, and left, um, but the there was really a lot of redoing. Here's one, a medieval church that uh, fortunately or unfortunately in the 1630s, uh, the roof collapsed. You can actually see here the old roof line in the uh, nave. And, but you can see how deep this uh, ch chancel was. Um, but what they did in uh, 1634, 35, 36, is redid the interior woodwork to conform to Protestant worship. And basically everything was gathered around here in the nave, seating for all the members of the church, a tall pulpit here, three-decker pulpit like at Christ Church, where you have the uh, lectern and the reading desk and then the pulpit itself. 
uh, and some pews for different members of that, um, that community. And the, um, the communion table may have been down closer here at one time, but now it's at that far end of that very deep uh, chancel. It's sort of in just like a whole different room. Uh, I, part of the work that I did uh, both for Jamestown and, and St. Mary City when I was studying early 17th century churches, I went around looking for those that retained a lot of their, uh, their um, fittings from, from the 16, uh, first quarter of the, of the 17th century. Uh, and it's not that many. Uh, in fact, I, I found a book which is, I found very useful and it was called Churches the Victorians Forgot. Um, it was a thin volume because the Victorians were, if anything, very thorough. They hated these kind of churches, which they called uh, prayer book churches. They hated pews. There was a guy named John Neal in the 1840s of the Ecclesiastical Society that uh, wrote a screed, is the only way to call, describe it, against pews, uh, thinking those were, you know, whatever they were they were not godly uh and you couldn't see the uh you couldn't see the communion table if you sat in these deep tall pews and so the victorians like to get rid of these things as well as galleries and clean them out and they were fairly thorough so it's it was always a delight to reach a church and find something like this one out in wales where it had all the uh, a lot of the early fittings from the 17th century prayer book arrangement uh, these are quite rare. Here's another one, just a, a little tiny church uh, in East Anglia, but it fit perfectly for my Jamestown research because all of this dates from the first decade of the interior woodwork. The, the, um, the, the church itself is, is a medieval church, but the interior woodwork, all of this dates from the dec first decade of the, um, of the 17th century. The pulpit itself is 1604. So you get a good sense by looking at these things what the range of uh, work craftsmanship was like uh, at the time of the Jamestown settlement. And you always had to take that in consideration of whether or not uh, we, there were craftsmen here in Jamestown or the willingness to, to do something of this level of, of carving. But nonetheless, you do get a sense of what the range of um, the types of fittings and the range of uh, craftsmanship would have been. Uh, one of the best ones that uh, I recommended to the Jamestown uh, archeologists when they were rethinking the 16, um, 17 church fittings is this one uh, in, it's just called Langley Chapel out in a turnip field in, in, in Shropshire in the west of England. Uh, it's, a, it's a late medieval church, but the interior fittings are all dating from the first uh, decade of the 17th century. So this is, and they were pretty rudimentary. One thing you ought to notice is that the idea of symmetry, of putting everything evenly arranged, the apertures, the windows and doors, uh, just didn't exist. You put windows where you needed them. So there's a window here lighting um, the... Um, uh, one of the, the lecterns, and then there's another window over here, lighting where the pulpit is, is, is located. The other thing that was actually very fascinating was the fact that the arrangement in the chancel was for a Puritan type of uh, communion where the table is not against the east wall, but brought out here, and people came in and sat around um, uh, benches here, and the, the minister came to the people seated, as opposed to coming up and kneeling against the uh, east end, as Archbishop Laud would have it. So here, because it was forlorn and forgotten, there's frozen in time, this, this Puritan moment, uh, and there were many more uh, of these kind of arrangements that, uh, uh, that were common in the late 16th and early 17th century, and surely some of this work uh, reappeared in, um, in American colonies. So it was, it was I, when Bill Kelso started doing archaeology at Jamestown in 1694, I, you know, I, I was out there um, saying, Bill, you got to find the, the early churches. Uh, but it only took him, you know, 15 years before he got around doing this. But in the summer of 2011, 
he in fact did come across what turned out to be the 1608 church, the first really uh, uh, purpose-built church at Jamestown, built you know within the first year of settlement after there was a fire earlier in the year. Um, and it was located, uh, as you can see, inside the walls uh, of the church. Here's the, the, um, the re re reconstructed church 1906 over here where the 1617 and 1640s church was. Uh, all of you know where it is. Uh, here's um, a detail from the archaeologists. Basically, the, 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 the entrance, the water entrance into Jamestown is in the center of the, uh, this long arm uh, facing onto the river. And so if you got off your boat there, and first door you would see uh, would have been right here on the south wall of the church. Uh, so it's, 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 it's centrally placed right there. It was a. Um, it was described briefly uh, in 1610 uh, as, or 1611, as being 24 feet uh, uh, by 64, 60 feet, and it turned out to be almost those. But the interesting thing is, the only reason it survived is because the guys who built it were, um, they were um, uh, sailors uh, from uh, from Christopher Newport, and they were sort of waiting to go back to England. So they got put to work digging post holes, and these were gigantic post holes. They were four feet uh, by about four feet. They were big, but even more extraordinary, they were like seven feet deep. Uh, you could fall into one of these things and struggle to get out. Uh, the reason they were so deep is because the, the span was so wide, 24 feet, that they, the, these one foot square posts sat down there and they had to be stable to carry uh, a load without any internal supports uh, to do that. So, and it looks, it worked out very nicely. I remember when they were working their way from the east to the west and I told them, if you find a post in the center of the west wall, that means there's no doorway there. Uh, it's going to be probably located here where it was traditionally uh, on many churches. Uh, the south, uh, uh, south wall is where many entrances in English churches are. And sure enough, they found that and said, your doorway is going to be right there. And it just happens to be right across, uh, right at the entrance. So that made nice sense. Um, so we worked this out and I designed some fittings for them in case they were going to reconstruct it, not physically, but certainly in, in images. You, you may recall that there were four burials here. This was the chancel. There is a screen across here. We know there's a chancel screen uh, from the description of it. Uh, so there are a lot of things we knew about, but one thing that didn't make any sense in, uh, in 2011 was this post hole right here. Uh, it made no sense. It was in the center of the, of the building. There would have been an aisle that ran from here up to the chancel. There would have been a pulpit over on this wall or that wall located there, and there would have been benches here. So why is this post there? It made no sense. Bill tried to make it into a, a tower or something like that. It was not until uh, just a couple of years ago, in 2019, when they went back to dig the church, they discovered, in fact, that they had missed one of these um, posts in the ground, and it was located right here. Uh, and here's their description of it. It's, again, it, it matched up very nicely, located here in the center, online with that. And what it turned out to be, now it makes sense that there were two large center posts in the in the aisles. So you had to walk around the post in the aisle, but those that those two posts supported the ridge beam that carried uh, the the apex of the roof. Uh, and we'd seen that before at Wollstone hometown uh, when Noel Hume excavated what he thought was the uh, church there. There were there were posts like this, so this made perfect sense to us, and, uh, and now it's resolved. <laughs> That worried me for about eight or nine years, but now, fortunately, we're good. Uh, this is just one of our drawings. is you know, hypothetical of what the church looked like. We know uh, there was no altar rail yet, but there was a chancel screen. Pulpit could have been there. Who knows? 
uh, it could be on this side. That's where the doorway was located. There was a description of a font just inside the doorway, a wooden font. And then there were benches. And then there was seating inside here for Lord Delaware and other uh, members of the, of the um, government who sat inside the uh, chancel in these sort of seats of honor. Uh, that carries on in Virginia uh, well into the 18th century. For example, the, the first Bruton Church in uh, Williamsburg, um, there was a special um, seat for the governor located inside the chancel for, uh, um, for the governors in the 1690s. Um, in 1901, this is all that was left of the churches and, or anything really at Jamestown was the tower. Uh, and at that time, a lot of intrepid women and a few men who helped them uh, decided they would excavate and find the church body of the church. Uh, so this is looking, uh, looking west uh, from the east end of the church. Uh, here's after excavating it in 1901, they found uh, graves. Of course, that's the graveyard outside the church. But here are the brick walls. These are actually um, buttresses. They were located along the side of the support the church because, again, of the broad spans. But they also found uh, inside on, um, the, the, the brick church walls, they found another smaller, narrower set of, of stone and brick uh, foundations, uh, which they realized was from the 1617 Argyle Church that we, we know from documents that was built in the exact same location. The trouble is that wall kind of petered out here and there. So we knew it was inside there, slightly smaller, but we didn't know the, the size of it. Here's a um, description uh, from the archeologists of what all these pieces are of the archeology span from 1901. Fortunately, again, hanging around long enough to get them to move. So they realized 1619, the anniversary was coming up, the 300th anniversary of holding the first uh, House of Burgesses meeting inside the 1617 church. So they decided to go back into the church and excavate it. And uh, they spent three years from 2016 to 2019 excavating the church. Some of their descriptions of what they found, they were found lots of burials, uh, but even more importantly, what they established was in fact, um, they found more evidence of that 1617 church, but I was quite excited that, you know, here's, here's the foundations found in, in 1901. This is all we knew about that church of 1617. We knew it was probably about 55 feet long by 20 feet. It was, I think it was described that way, but other than that, we thought it was parallel with the interior of the brick church and it was just sort of built around it. But in fact, what they discovered, despite all these burials in here, there was remnants of the west wall with this yellow clay foundations uh, that ran across here. This is about uh, maybe six feet from the east wall of the brick church foundations across here. Just fragments, tiny little fragments. You might see a little bit of there and there of the, of the um, east wall of the church. So that was very nice to establish that, but even better in, uh, remember the old days and when we can all go out and look at things, this was just the um, two years ago now in 2019, about this time of the year, they were gonna repair inside the, um, inside the tower and they were looking for the church uh, foundations. They had to remove about five inches of concrete that was laid down here. Uh, and once they did, they discovered perfectly intact brick uh, foundations for the 1617 church. Uh, so there it is, in situ, untouched. Uh, uh, and this is now what we now know is the church, this is the 16, the dimensions of the 1617 church. About 19, almost 20 feet by 50, say 53 feet. 21 feet by 53, but you can see it, it, it's not inside the here, it's moved further west. And so when they had to build 
this brick church, they had to tear down part of this and, and but kept it basically where it was. So that's, that's fabulous to find that kind of information. Uh, they also found a whole lot more about the brick church. Uh, just briefly, it was probably started in the early 1640s. It was still incomplete uh, by the late 1640s. There were very few people in Jamestown by this time, maybe just a handful of families, and, uh, and it was very difficult. A lot of the, the, the parish itself had, was shrinking. They were moving, you know, south side of the James River it used to be part of that parish, but uh, it got hived off. And so there are fewer and fewer people there to support the construction of a brick church. Uh, but we do know it was eventually finished by the 1650s. Uh, it's a, and it was a, described as a very handsome, commodious brick church, uh, which unfortunately in September of 1676 was burned by uh, during Bacon's rebellion when the Bacon's followers came to Jamestown and, and torched the, the, the town. It probably didn't uh, just completely destroy it because the church was rebuilt uh, by 1680. Uh, it, was, it was completely rebuilt by that time. Uh, the tower itself, we know a little bit more. It was uh, built in the 1690s around and, and continuing being finished up by about 1700. Uh, repairs to the brickwork on the tower in, in 2016 and 20, no, 2015 and 16 shows that it was actually raised about two or three feet at the top. So it was actually rebuilt uh, slightly uh, in the early 18th century. There's, there's descriptions and documents in 1701 that it was not finished. Uh, the reason the tower is put on because by the late 1690s, this was the home church of James Blair, who was the commissary or the deputy to the um, Bishop of London. So he wanted a prestigious church to um, sort of the, strengthen the, the, the um, Anglican church at this time. So we, you know, a lot of, a lot of older books say this was built in 1647, but uh, that's not possible because all the brickwork here is characteristic of the kind of brickwork you see in England dating from about the 1660s through about 1700. So 1690s is perfect for this, this date of this. The other thing they found inside on the second floor, this was a window, uh, were slots for a bench that went around on three sides of it. And this was where uh, either the vestry would meet, uh, you know, during their, uh, monthly meetings, uh, discuss finances and everything else, or it's possibly where uh, children were catechized uh, by the minister uh, on, on Sundays. So there is, is fabulous to see actually knowing now that this upper part of the tower is actually used for some purpose. Um, that's, so that's what we, we, that's what we know. We have to see, I've already jumped into the late 17th century. Uh, this is Newport Parish Church or St. Luke's Church, traditionally dated 1632, uh, but now because we did dendrochronology, uh, the, the date sometime after 1677. There are a couple of sticks of wood in here that still survive from the 17th century around the doorway, and that's where we came up with the dendro date, uh, which is very nice to fit in here. But the, the plan of this building is extraordinary. Uh, the tower is, you know, a lot of people have argued that the upper part of the tower is later, but that's not the case. It's all integral part. Uh, but it has the same sort of plan as those Jamestown churches from the very early period. It had a central aisle. This is uh, what you're seeing here is the, uh, the fittings that were uh, installed in the 1950s when this building was restored for about the fifth or sixth time in its, in its history. Um, you know, if you squint a lot and, and make it out of focus, you can almost see that it is really looks like 17th century fitting. So there's some problems with it, but not, you know, on the whole, it's not too bad. It's certainly the layout is very good, uh, where you have a center aisle um, with the pulpit located right next to the what's called the, the chancel screen, which is an open area here that separates the uh, place where communion was taken uh, from the nave or the body of the church. Uh, and then there's a door on the other side of that chancel screen, which is the chancel door, 
for those to, who after taking communion would leave uh, through that chancel door. That was absolutely typical. You saw that in the church I showed you in Shropshire. Uh, the, the other thing, it's, you know, these things sort of just show up uh, when you're starting to do research. Here is actually a baluster from the original baluster from the church. It was ripped out by a tourist in 1640, uh, in 1845 from Connecticut, and he gave it to the Connecticut Historical Society, and they kept it in their collections for over 100 years, and in the 1980s, it was given to a guy named John Bivens, who was a, a furniture historian down at Old Salem, and it had been, it's been in the Mesda collection since the 80s. Well, we borrowed it, and uh, in measuring it, we found that it actually is uh, five inches taller than the, the reconstructed altar rail that was in there. And that altar rail was based on this um, original um, baluster that was probably from a, a stair, it was certainly from staircase because it had angles here and there where they, it showed that it was uh, a, on a sloped surface. Um, so the altar rail should be actually be about five inches taller. Uh, than what they did in 1957, but that's that's fine. Um, now, to put that church and the Jamestown churches in context, I'm going to show you a church built in uh, in England in the 1660s with all its fittings from that period of time. It's called Saint Savior and Formark, and you you'll soon get the picture here. So here is that church with all its fittings dating from the 1660s. Same sort of layout with a central aisle, uh, pews, uh, in this case, all the way uh, up and down the, um, uh, the body of the church. Then you see the um, pulpit uh, located very near the chancel screen. There's the chancel screen. Again, it's pierced, uh, very elaborate. Um, you can see it down here, nice carving in it, but everything else. You know, again, squinting your eyes, this is what an image of a very good Virginia church would have looked like on the inside of you know, the best parish churches uh, in the late mid to late 17th century. Uh, here's the plan of it, uh, and it's been called a traditional Anglican plan. This is one that was very common. Uh, built uh, from the late 16th century, basically through uh, the 17th century, again, exact time of settlement of Virginia. And you'll notice that the proportions uh, are there twice as long as they, it is wide, usually about, say, 65, 70 feet long by 25 to 30 feet wide, a central aisle, either a door here in the, in the west or often also in the south, but you see here's the chancel door there, uh, the, the pews, the font located in this position here in the back of the church. Again, uh, just like um, Virginia churches, you have the clerk's desk, the reading desk, and the pulpit, the screen. In this case, it's a slightly later uh, 18th century iron railing uh, around the, um, the communion table up against the east end. Uh, it was Archbishop Laud who, who um, in the 1630s, uh, basically said you've got to put a railing around your communion table uh, to prevent um, the, the profane use of the communion table. Often uh, teachers would take the table out and use it to teach their students or dogs. There's always dogs in churches and dogs would uh, profane the, the holy table, as they said, so they needed a railing around it. But the Puritans hated that, and they would, and during the Civil War, they chopped those down. So you see seating around the outside of the, in the chancel for people waiting to go up to take communion and then exit out. Uh, windows again are not necessarily uh, symmetrical, or but are placed, and you can see buttresses are quite common uh, straight through the 17th century. Uh, just to give you, uh, uh, here is. Newport Parish Church, the same scale as uh, St. Savior and Formar, it's, you know, it's, it's the same, it, this is the, the basis for that, uh, the, these English, traditional English plans. 
here is the first Bruton Parish Church. It was excavated in 1938 um, by um, an amateur uh, because they had those crazy people who thought the um, um, there are all, all kinds of things were buried in the churchyard uh, that they they sort of this was 1938 they thought the answer the world peace and Shakespeare's uh, um, and the crown jewels they were all in this some vault in this church and they came back in 1991 and wanted to dig again in this place uh, which was quite exciting for Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, here's a plan of a church by uh, a traveler who had a first grade education in drawing, but nonetheless, you get a sense of the church. It had buttresses. He unfortunately didn't draw them, but it had these shaped gables, and it also had a churchyard enclosed in brick, and here is the gate on the north side, and it had this little uh, probably brick ball there at the top of the pediment, a brick ball very similar to that one was discovered by uh, archaeologists in Gloucester County at Abington Church after a tree fell over during one of the hurricanes in, in, in the old uh, 17th century church. Uh, so that was, again, a nice little discovery in recent times. But the plan of this is exactly the same as all the rest. There's uh, Newport Parish Church, you see, almost identical in terms of length and width. Uh, all worked out. So there would have been a doorway here, a chancel door located here, and in this church the chancel screen was located there and, and a seat for uh, Governor Nicholson when he came, became governor uh, in, in um, Williamsburg in uh, 1699 was located right there. Uh, these kind of churches, uh, there are not many of them, but a few that survive, you get the, you get the same sort of pattern. Uh, this is St. Peter's uh, Church in New Kent County. Uh, these are some of the largest bricks I've ever seen. Uh, there's a guy named uh, Thomas Brickwall Jackson who built it, um, and these are these are massive bricks. I don't know what he was into, but he, he, he built with big bricks. Uh, what happened is in the 18th century, they added a wing onto here, but it's the same sort of arrangement, 64 feet long, 28 and a half feet. The tower was added by a guy named William Walker in 1740 for Reverend Patrick Henry. Uh, this is the pattern that we see that survived a long time for since 1608 all the way through the 1770s. This was the, this was the church that was the Anglican church plan in Virginia, twice as long as it is wide, central aisle, chancel, doorway, pulpit up here located in this. The trouble is, uh, or not the trouble, the interesting thing is, is that no other colony in, in America built Anglican churches like they did in Virginia. Part of the reason is because of the traditional plan. Once they established it, they kept it. And as many of you know, the Anglican Church was basically orphaned for about a century, from 16, basically from 1624 until around the time of, Archb uh, uh, time of James Blair becoming the commissary in the 1680s and 90s. They eventually started taking an interest in their, um, in their diocese of London, which Virginia was a part of, started taking interest again in the church. And by that time, being Virginians, once you do it, it becomes settled way of doing things. However, everywhere else in the American colonies, the church, the Anglican church was not established when it, where it was until the very end of the 17th century. And by that time, there was a fire in London that uh, destroyed most of the churches uh, and were rebuilt, and they were rebuilt on a different kind of plan, not that traditional plan, but this more auditory square box plan called an auditory plan. So here's St. James in Anne Arundel County. The main door is not here in the West End. It's in the center of the uh, south uh, wall, and the pulpit is directly opposite here. Uh, and uh, other, other churches, there might be galleries around here. Now, if any of you know anything about uh, New England churches, that is exactly the meeting house plan that became very common in New England. 
at the same time. So Virginians created this traditional plan. They stuck with it all the way through and um, everywhere else they, they, they moved on to more modern plans. So that what makes Virginia so unique is it stands out as being a, that, that uh, harking back to an older tradition. The other thing we think about Virginia is that it was a uh, land of brick churches, but in fact, we know that the only thing that really survives, uh, except for three or four occasions, uh, are a few 40 brick churches, well, and there are about four frame churches. But uh, what we know from uh, documents is that for the most part, at the time of the revolution, most Anglican churches were wooden buildings. So what I always tell my students, what survives is not necessarily what existed uh, at the time. So we always need to keep that in mind. Uh, let me go back very quickly and I'll try to wind this up in another uh, 10 minutes, is um, talk about what we don't know. And what we don't know is after the 1620s, we know that churches were established along this, except for Martin's Hundred in Jamestown, none of these sites have been excavated. So we don't know what these churches look like. Uh, and as I said, that the middle of the 17th century really is the dark ages. We get fragments of information here and there about what was going on in Virginia in terms of churches, but parishes were amorphous. They were, they were like amoebas. They were growing and then they, they were cut in half and it was hard to decide where to put a church because once you decide to build a church, you put a lot of money in it and you, and you change your parish boundaries, then you, you're basically leaving the church high and dry in the wrong place. Uh, so there was always the incentive not to build well, but to build basically modest little wooden frame buildings that looked hardly any better than tobacco houses. Most of these were small, 18 to 25 feet. 40 to 55 feet in length, covered with uh, wooden clapboards, and probably most of them had no foundations, but the, the posts were sunk directly in the wall. And when, seven, when archaeologists excavate 17th century sites, this is what they do. It's a matter of connecting the dots. These are um, excavated holes where posts once sat in them. So is this a house? And what's this little section here? Is that a fence line? We don't know. You have to sort of sort it out. This kind of post in the ground construction began the first day that they set foot in Jamestown and started building. They, this is a 1609 house uh, reconstruction based on the um, excavations here. Here's a cellar. And these were mud wall buildings. Uh, post in the ground construction became the way of building in Virginia in the 17th century. It was cheap, easy, not much uh, uh, technology involved in it, and it, it served the immediate purposes, but if they weren't repaired, they would fall down within 10 or 15 years or be eaten up by termites. Uh, even this church, and this is, I use this church because this is sort of a gold standard for us. This is designs for a church, uh, St. Paul's Church, the first St. Paul's Church in what would become Edenton, North Carolina. This was before Edenton was set out, it was a post-in-the-ground church, and they did these sketches for it because they wanted some glass to put in the windows. Uh, when a guy named um, John Ermstone, who became the minister there, you know, when he went into the church, he found a cow rooting around inside the church because the doors, as he said, were thrown open, and the cows are, and, and pigs were also rooting around digging up things. The, probably the bones of their ancestors. Uh, but this is a complete set of drawings, which is fabulous. It was preserved in the Society for the Propagation of the Gospels uh, 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 letter books in London. And it shows, here's the one wall, the front entrance wall, and here's the chancel screen that you saw earlier. Um, here's the side. These are posts that would be driven into the ground. Here's the east end with the chancel door. So it was 40 by, I think, 20 feet, 24 feet. Uh, this, the only unusual thing is it has two chancel doors instead of one, but it locates the pulpit. So here's that traditional Anglican plan that I mentioned. It has everything about it. The screen is across here. Um, there it is. 
It's a very lovely one with these drops here, uh, these chancel screens. Um, and I'm, I'm showing you some period um, uh, furniture from English churches just to give you an idea of what these early um, uh, pieces of furniture in these uh, Virginia churches would, would have looked like. Um, here's a railing, 1630s railing, and other rails that you see here. Uh, the screens, these screens survived until the 1720s. They go out of fashion in Virginia in the 1720s. Uh, here's one in Bermuda that survives from the 17-teens, one in England from the 1650s, I think. Um, but you can see some of them are very elaborate, some are very simple. Uh, pulpit, uh, you get all kinds, from very simple ones to more elaborate and, and elaborately carved ones that you see over here. Um, and seating, all kinds. Uh, here's the lollipop version here. Uh, here's one with the sort of fleur-de-lis and, and, and basic ones uh, that we see. And then we get enclosed seats or pews, uh, simple paneling. Um, eventually, there are some more elaborate ones. These are called gentry pews uh, for the sort of the gentry of the, of the parish. These kind of pews actually were built here in Virginia uh, at um, Poplar Church uh, in Petsworth Parish in, in Gloucester County in 1677. There's this description of two of these being constructed in the inside the chancel for the wealthy people of the parish. So these these kind of enclosed gentry pews did exist here uh, in Virginia, showing there is a hierarchy of, of fittings. So I, I come back and I want to finish up here with Christ Church. Uh, it, of course, it's an extraordinary building. I, I, people always say, what's the greatest building around? And I say it's Christ Church. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's unbelievable that the best church in Virginia ever built uh, in the colonial period, still survives and pretty well intact. I mean, that's just extraordinary. Uh, you know, you, usually you don't get both of those together. But what preceded this building? What preceded it? Well, you know, they set out to look, and it's only, well, it's only been 15 years uh, when Thane Harpole and Dave Brown did some test excavations to the uh, east of the church, you know, finding elements of what possibly is the earlier 17th century church. But uh, you know, they didn't find enough to really del delimit the size of it or even talk much about how it was put together. You know, there are fragments of uh, paving tiles and things like that. So, you know, it's easy to conceive of this as a being a post in the ground church, but with some fancy woodwork in it, uh, with paving tiles. Uh, I, I expect it would be twice as long as it was wide, uh, but we just simply don't know. Um, I'll leave it there as a possibility of something that we will discover, and maybe in 15 years' time, I will be able to come back to you and tell you what we uh, found there. Maybe it's sooner than later. I will leave it at that. Amen. And I will end the show and try to stop that. So I'm back here for questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Uh, any, any questions? I like Charlie Hart's little thing with the cookies there. <laughs> hey, Carl, I have a question. So some of those shots, sure. the, the pew, the, the uh, woodwork in the pews looks very familiar to what's in Christ Church. Yes. Um, but not all churches would have been fully pewed, correct? You would have had different that's levels. Right. Uh, yeah, that's right. Different levels. Um, uh, oftentimes they might do them in sequences. Uh, um, you know, the, the, but, you know, Christ Church looks like it was fully pewed. Um, you know, I don't see any variations in, in that. Uh, but there, you know, from documents, you know that uh, oftentimes they just have benches in the back and they might just pew the first, you know, uh, area right around the pulpit. And then eventually uh, it, they might fully pew them. And what about the, um, that font position being by the west door, were they sometimes outside the churches too, but they were always traditionally west 
They were inside okay. the church. Uh, I don't know any that were outside. Okay. Um, the one in, in the 1608 church was wooden. It was basically a, a, a hollowed out log, um, as it was described um, by uh, the um, one of the, you know, the Jamestown um, secretaries. Um, of course, all the stone ones, all the stone that you see anywhere is imported from England. Uh, so any, any, um, any, um, the paving stones, you know, by the time Christchurch, your present church is built, obviously they're opening up um, the Aquia Quarry up in Stafford County. But uh, otherwise, you know, all, all stone that you might find uh, is important. And oftentimes it's described as Bristol stone. Uh, not because it was made or there was around the quarry in Bristol, but it was exported through the Avon Valley uh, through Bristol to the New World. Carl, um, is there, have you ever seen any indication of gentry pews either at Bruton or at Christ Church? Um, well, yes. I mean, Christ Church, the the two, you know, the pews, the Carter pew, you know, it's bigger. It's it was uh, upholstered. Uh, it had a railing around uh, with this, you know, a curtain. I've never seen one that had a fireplace in it. You've, I found a few of those in England, where they, you know, basically they brought their easy chair in and had a fireplace going, and uh, you know, they could walk out and <laughs> be right next door to the the manor house. Um, there are occasionally um, uh, galleries that are built specifically for uh, the gentry, and they uh, some some sometimes they were given permission to actually cut a window in to light it. Um, a, a couple of those I think Del Upton shows illustrates some in his book on the um, the um, parish churches of, of Virginia. It was written in 1985. Actually, his his book inspired me to start. Uh, doing this research on churches because I said, well, if you've done Virginia, I'll just go up in Maryland and do the same thing and I can knock that out in a year. And I, as soon as I got to Maryland, I realized they're not even the same form. And so that made me have to rethink the whole idea that Virginia was a unique experience. Uh, you know, basically you couldn't find an established church in the American colonies except in Virginia until the late you know, late 17th century, the 1690s. Uh, that you know, that's that's a long time to be left out and forgotten. Um, you know, the uh, Bishop of London only showed up in his 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 old diocese of Virginia in 1907. You know, he he was only about 150 years too late uh, to do anything about it. Would there have been a chancel screen in the original Christ Church? The little wooden church. I, 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 yeah, I expect so. Uh, most of these did having what we know. Most of them did have a chancel screen. It, it goes out of fashion. Uh, Christopher Wren, I think, erected a, a couple of them in the London churches that he rebuilt, in part in response to the conservatism of the vestry that was commissioning the construction of those churches. Uh, he didn't like them. He wanted a large open room where everyone could see the minister uh, and uh, actually see the, well, not necessarily see the altar, um, because uh, like his best church that he always recommended for everyone was uh, St. James Piccadilly, uh, that uh, the originally the pulpit was in the center aisle and the altar was behind it against the east end, the big east window. Um, and so you couldn't have seen it uh, from most of the church. Uh, and of course, the Victorians hated that. They really wanted to see the altar. Um, and so when, 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 when that's why they got rid of a lot of these older um, arrangements. Dr. Lounsbury, we have received, yes. we've received a few questions in the chat. Um, okay. See, Rebecca asked, besides Jamestown and St. Luke's, do you know of any other Virginia churches with buttresses? Well, uh, Bruton Church had buttresses. Um, there, and outside there, <clears throat> Virginia, there are other churches that have buttresses. So buttresses, 
uh, obviously they support the walls because <clears throat> uh, if you go to like um, Merchants Hope Church and you stand at one end of it and just look straight, you'll see that it just bows. It just kind of bows out, you know, because of what, what it's doing. It's like middle-aged sag, you know, the, there's a roof, a heavy roof on it and it's pushing down and those walls are, are wanting to spread out. And so there, uh, and that so buttresses counteract uh, that that spread. Uh, so yeah, we, we often think of buttresses as being medieval when they were, but they also survived well into the 18th century in many places. And along that line, somebody asked, was the abandonment of buttresses a decision based on design or structural needs, or was it aesthetic? Um, that's hard. Um, uh, they, they, they disappear, so that means that, you know, uh, they figured out how to span that, those spaces uh, and took their chances, in part uh, because they, they started using what are called king post trusses, like the one at, at, at Christ Church. I mean, you know, it's a fabulous uh, uh, roof at Christ Church. I mean, there's so much great stuff at Christ Church. Um, and the king post helped uh, because the king post acts as intention. It kind of pulls uh, the the lower parts of the uh, principal rafters. They're trying to keep it from uh, spreading out and it's pulling it back in. Um, but you know, it, it clearly it must be aesthetics um, uh, in the end because you know you don't see them by the end of the 18th century. And the, the, you know, so they, they either they've improved their um, uh, building technology and, and aesthetics kind of went along with that. Any other in the chat room or whatever else? If I touch this, I'm sure I, I'll, something will happen. It looks like there's another question. Uh, did the frame churches that are mostly lost have a brick foundation? Uh, well, 17th century, I can't tell you. Um, I, I suspect that most of them were post in the ground structures in the 17th century. By the 18th century, I think most of them would have been, um, had brick foundations uh, or stone foundations if we're moving further west. Um, again, oh, one other thing that, um, you know, the past 10 years have actually, you know, it's really, for me, it's been very helpful to have all this new archaeology, and, and now the pattern is, is clear. I just need someone to go dig me a, a 1650 church somewhere. So, you know, talk to your archaeologist, take a pass around a collection and dig one up, because I'd, I'd love to see see one. I tried to get them to dig um, uh, at Dancing Point in um, Charles City County. There was, there, there was one there at the confluence of the... Uh, Chickahominy and the James, but it was too big an area and they couldn't find anything. Um, so uh, well, that would have been a 1620s church, but a 1650s church or 60s church, uh, I'd really like to see them. I mean, the descriptions of them, the one I mentioned at, at in, in Petsworth Parish in Gloucester County, uh, Poplar Church, that was a post in the ground church in the 1670s, and it was a very fine church. It had those gentry pews. Uh, so the idea of, you know, crummy foundations, but yet nice woodwork is kind of hard for us uh, to conceive in the same boat because they, they seem to be working opposite one another. But nonetheless, uh, that seems to exist. And also uh, Christ Church in Middlesex, there's a description of a very fine church post in the ground. Uh, I don't remember the exact date offhand, uh, 1680s, I believe. Um, but again, good, good, good woodwork, but it's post in the ground, and it had uh, down at the bottom to protect the, the, the post from water, they had uh, a, a little skirting that stuck out, uh, sort of like uh, a, a pent, as they called it, uh, sort of like pents that you see in Pennsylvania over, you know, a little kind of rooflet along uh, the uh, building. Uh, it was down at the bottom there. So, um, so I, I sort of think that most of these would have been pretty modest, 
in Maryland, uh, there's a description of a couple of them uh, of churches that were, you know, basically said, you know, can't can't tell them that the difference between them and a tobacco house. And tobacco houses were basically just uh, frame buildings with posts in the ground. I've got a question about fonts. Um, of course, Christ Church has that magnificent one, which I assume came from England. Uh, did most of them come from England? Were most of them stone? And do many early fonts still survive? Um, probably um, a half dozen to a dozen fonts survive. They're all, yes, they are all imported, although in Fairfax County in Truro Parish in the 1770, early 1770s, let's put it that way, a guy named William Copine, who was a carver, he did work at um, also at um, a choir church in Stafford County. Um, but the vestry there, and this is, this is extremely rare, I mean, this is what architectural historians live for, is to actually open the vestry book and, and you, you see the vestry sitting around the table saying, oh, that looks like a nice font. And said, Mr. Copine, we want you to design a, a stone font for us. Uh, after Langley's book of our, uh, let's see, Workman's Treasury of Design, which was published in 1740. Uh, and then they go on to say, well, that's nice to know what book it's from. It's, it's plate 150, the upper left-hand corner. So there are four of them in that on that page. And so you know exactly. But even that said, you know, that the bowl survives, not the not the, the stand, but the bowl survives. And he even though they said do it like that, he, he kind of modified it. <laughs> so you, even when you find the specs, they you, you got to be careful because you know uh, they left in 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 colonial period, uh, they left a lot of the details to the workmen. Say, look. I don't know, you know, George Washington, the guy that we, you know, think took a lot of interest in, in building, uh, when he was adding his new wing or new rooms on in, in 1787, uh, a workman sent him a drawing, says, I can't figure this out. I don't know anything. If it looks okay, fine with me. Uh, now, his uh, junior partner, Thomas Jefferson, of course, was more pedantic than anyone else. I mean, he would, he would uh, certainly pour over uh, those work, those 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 books. Uh, he, he called Andrea Palladio my Bible. That was four books of architecture by uh, a guy named Andrea Palladio, which was published in 1570, uh, but translated into English and was very popular. And um, he, he called it my Bible. And uh, Benjamin Henry Latrobe, who Jefferson hired to work on the Capitol. Uh, went to see him, he says, the old man fishes everything out of those old French books. You know, so he, he, he thought him a very pedantic man who, you know, no, oh, I'd better not change this because it goes against Palladio, my Bible. So he, he had a very Protestant mind, I guess, in that sense. Um, to follow up on the font question, um, I, I really am interested in symbolism. And the reason that the font was at the back of the church was because that represented the beginning of a Christian's journey to God via the center aisle towards the the um, take communion table. Yeah, yes, uh, yes, that's right. Uh, you know, uh, even even if you want to carry this, you got to be careful. You know, symbolism you can carry so far, uh, but you know the the fact that it is a triumphal arch that but the brick frontispiece in the west end. Uh, west doorway at Christ Church is is basically a um, it, it's a triumphal arch like a Roman triumphal arch that that's that, you know they commissioned so that uh, uh, Roman generals could pass under in victory uh, but this is a you know you're moving from the secular world into uh, into uh, a holy world so that's symbolic and having uh, the newborn babe being brought in to this community of Christians that's very symbolic there at the at the very west end of the church uh, that then they would be christened there at the west end. I mean, it wasn't always the case, though. Uh, and there is just as um, as many uh, Anglican churches uh, and other churches that used um, small basins, you know, oftentimes 
next to the pulpit. Uh, so that was not always the case. And some, 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 uh, I think many, many um, uh, baptisms also took place at home. Uh, the minister made the rounds quite a bit. And I can tell you, most ministers, especially in the 17th century, hated it because, you know, it, it was rough traveling to get from one part of their uh, parish to the next because the roads were miserable. You know, people got lost all the time. Um, you know, there's, there's stories of being, you know, camping out and wolves are just right on the other side of the, of the fire. And so you always sleep with one eye open so, you're, so you won't be eaten by a wolf. Um, but, you know, they, they had to make the rounds because most people chose to be buried uh, not at their parish church, uh, because the parish church might not be there in 20 years, but certainly their plantation, which they're going to pass down to their children, would be. So there's more stability in 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 uh, burying your 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 parents or your your, your children uh, on your own land as opposed to at the church. The other problem with the church is you have to remember the church is usually closed. Uh, you know, basically, except on Sundays and maybe uh, if there's a service during the middle of the week. Um, and the gates are locked, uh, but in all, all, all parish, uh, all, all churchyards were ruled, you know, that they, they very careful about um, um, paling them in, building wooden fences around it. Of course, pigs uh, are, are turned loose in uh, colonial Virginia. And they are rooting around, like I said, Bishop Ermstone found a cow in in St. Paul's Church, and, and 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 pigs were always rooting around, digging up your your you know your loved ones in the churchyard. Uh, they were added at Bruton Church until they finally built a brick wall in, in the 1750s. But presumably before that time, uh, there was a, just a wooden wooden fence, and that's easily. Uh, uh, Pigs have a way of getting to um, where they want to go. Carl, there's another question, two questions. Um, one, what from where is that wonderful graphic on your very first slide? And then someone asked, do you have any thoughts about Bishop Mead's report of Poplar Springs Church in Gloucester? He references roof angels. Are you aware of any other roof angels in Virginia? Um, and what was the first one about the image I had, the first image? What was my first image? Uh, the first one was that image that you showed of the communion table. Um, the first, the opening slide, it was the communion table, and it looks like a scene in maybe 16th century England. Oh, yeah. Um, a lot of those are from Fox's uh, Book of Martyrs. Uh, it, um, I can't remember Fox's first name. John Fox, anyway, uh, he is sort of like a, a martyrology. You know, is, is basically all the brave people that uh, that were burned and harassed by the Catholics. Uh, it was published as you know, basically a way of bucking up the Protestant Church uh, uh, to show that they, there's this tradition of of dying for your faith. So that was probably that one. I like to rob wherever I can images. Um, so, you know, it, it, it makes for nice scenes and whenever I can find new ones, I love them. Um, there are a lot of pamphlets that were published and sometimes these had uh, images in there showing the right way to set uh, a communion table, the right implements on the table uh, or, or the wrong ones. Uh, so that's always interesting to see that. Uh, and what was the, the second question? Robert? Second one was, um, um, it was, do you have any thoughts about Bishop Mead's report of Poplar Springs Church in Gloucester? He references oh, yes. roof angels. Um, well, <clears throat> within the limited iconography that the Protestants allowed, um, angels could be in the architecture, as, as uh, Paul Simon would say. Um, and uh, you, you you might have the um, and a lot of a lot of these early churches were also um, like at Christ Church they were vaulted they had uh, uh, rounded and sometimes they were painted uh, blue to represent the cope of heaven 
and um, sometimes stars. I've seen those stars, and certainly occasionally you'll see angels. Uh, descriptions of them, but again, you know, nothing survives. Uh, there's a there's a fabulous description of, and I think some that su had survived and were painted over at Christ Church in Boston, um, painted in the early 18th century. So I, I, I wouldn't doubt it that that was the case. Uh, you know, who am I to, you know, uh, you know, take issue with Bishop Mead, uh, even though the building was probably long gone by the time, but you know, these things carry on. So it's, it's quite possible. There's one more. Um, I'm curious about the location of the original Christ Church between boggy valleys and with limited accessibility. When high ground is available less than a quarter of a mile away, what was the rationale behind the location of the original church? And, and maybe that could be a larger question of, is there a difference in where they're locating churches and courthouses? Um, uh, yes and no. Um, uh, the, there has to be, uh, all right, many churches are located, or how did you get around in, um, in the 17th century? You got around not by roads. Uh, the horses were around, but there weren't that many. Uh, and so traveling over land was difficult, but traveling by water uh, was easier. Uh, there were canoes and uh, small boats and things like that. Uh, uh, parishes span the water. For example, um, there are many parishes that span both sides of the James River. Same thing uh, in uh, the Rappahannock River. So uh, the parishes on the south side of, uh, in Middlesex County used to be uh, part of uh, uh, the northern neck, and they would simply hive those off as more and more uh, uh, greater number of settlement people being settled in that area. Um, so I would I would presume that where you look for most early churches is by the water, but um, because parishes, I mean, the trouble with parishes were they they were so the the, the boundaries were so. Uh, volatile. They, they change as soon as, you know, 10 people moved in in one area. Uh, you know, they're agitating, we need to move the church closer to where we are. Uh, so there has to evolve a, uh, you know, stability in terms of number of people uh, in a parish who can afford to build a parish church or can afford to build a chapel of ease, which is basically a, uh, a subsidiary church. Uh, and that, you know, that evolves in the 17th century uh, when they kind of figure out we need this number of people to make, a, make it viable to have, to, because they had to pay for the, uh, the, 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 the minister's uh, salary, they had to pay for burials of, of paupers, they had to take care of the poor, uh, and they had to build um, uh, churches, and they also had to uh, provide with a, uh, a glebe that is a farm and, and property on it for the minister who might live there or might not. So there was a lot of money. And so you had to have that many people to do that. And most churches, not most, all churches, all courthouses, all public buildings, uh, they would build them. Uh, the way they did that is that if, you, if the vestry decides to build a new church and say the church cost, um, 100,000 pounds of tobacco. That's probably too much, but it's all right. Uh, they'd have to raise that money basically in three straight years because they pay the first third to the, to the builder once they sign the contract. They pay the second third to the builder after the walls are up, and they pay the, the final turnkey uh, after he gives them the key to the church when it's all finished. Uh, and so they're, so you're... you're um, your taxes each year might be, you know, if you're not building a church, might be, say, 10,000 pounds for a very rich man, or no, let's say 100 pounds. And, uh, and, then, and then they decide to build a church, and your, your taxes go up the next year to 500 pounds. And it would be 500 pounds for three years, and then it goes back to 100 pounds. So, you know, it's a major decision to build a church. It was often called the plague of building. Uh, you know, it was it was such a struggle to build many of these churches because they didn't have money. They didn't, 
they couldn't rely on uh, anybody except themselves. Um, so that, that was costly. The other thing that happens is that uh, Virginia becomes, I think, a one of the, the key things in, in, in American understanding of geography evolves here. Uh, where do you put public buildings? You put them in towns. Uh, if there are no towns, where do you put public buildings? Well, the early courthouses are by the waterways, uh, but they might be very inconvenient for most people and they complain about it. So eventually, especially when, when, um, when parishes and then counties become more stable in terms of their boundaries, there's the idea of putting a building, a public building, a church or a courthouse in the geographical center of uh, that county, which is certainly it's not an English notion, and it gets it gets um, it becomes it, it shows up. It's there by the late seventeenth century, uh, so they're going to make access equally difficult for everyone. Uh, it's sort of an odd sort of thing, but that's the way it worked. Uh, they usually when they try to find the geographic center uh, of of the parish, they might try to locate it near a road, and certainly they want to have a good spring or water source there for, for obviously uh, necessities of the people as well as cleaning the building. Um, but they will, they will locate it in the center, um, usually along the road or something like that. So from some counties, like Middlesex County, it's very easy because there was a road. The county was narrow, but it's like 40 miles long. And so they put one in the center, but then they put two chapel of eases, uh, one in the in the um, in the north and one in, in the south. And the one in the south and the middle one still survive, uh, all dating from about 1714. And they're basically, you know, every six or eight miles apart, figuring that you could walk to church, but at uh, you know, in a reasonable amount of time. Um, but that took a lot of extraordinary effort. And the problem was uh, you might have a church service, but it wouldn't be a full church service because you only have one minister and that minister uh, might make the round. So he might be in the main church um, for two Sundays and then in, in one of the chapels of ease one Sunday and the other chapel of ease the other Sunday. Um, so, you know, you don't, that part of the 17th century problem is not in it well into the 18th century is not having enough ministers to fill their um, um, pulpits. They, they were always struggling for that. In 1650s, uh, they, they write to the Farrar family uh, of Little Getting of T.S. Eliot fame, um, saying, you know, maybe a fifth of our pulpits are occupied, um, a fifth out of, say, you know, 60 or so, so maybe, you know, an eighth. Uh, I can't count, but anyway, not many. So a lot of places didn't have a minister for a long period of time, long periods of time. Hey, Carl, what are the, how are they determining location in English parishes? We know those parishes are smaller, correct, than, than Virginia parishes or not, but how are they uh, determining location in those well, churches? They, vary. They, they do vary, Robert, because up in the north, uh, in the in the Dales and, and in the Lake District, you know, they're, they're very big parishes. They're almost Virginia-sized parishes, several miles. Um, elsewhere, they might be very tiny. Um, uh, and, uh, but those things evolve time out of mind. I mean, you know, they, they, these churches have been around for hundreds of years, hundreds and hundreds of years. And um, they don't, you know, once they get established in that place, uh, you know, some of them get abandoned because, you know, what, for whatever reason, you know, the, the land is gobbled up by a, a landowner and he, he moves the church so he can have a, a nice green area in front of his house, um, but not far. Uh, so they didn't have that problem because, it, you know, Virginia in, in America was just a blank slate in terms of a Christianized landscape. There weren't places of tradition uh, going back even before Christianity in, in England uh, where people, people worshiped or there were Roman, you know, temples in this location and they carried on uh, when, when, when 
uh, Roman Britain was Christianized um, and it might have been broken by the Saxon period. But certainly, uh, if you look at the Doomsday Book of 1086, you know, many of those churches, you know, the, the, the building might be a lot different, but it's in that location. Uh, but here, you know, it's just scrambling around. We do have, I think we missed one question in chat. Um, when Virginia's churches began to grow into the T and cruciform layouts in the early 18th century, did the transept doors continue to serve as chancel doors in the same manner that you described in 17th century churches? Um, certainly in T-shaped uh, churches like uh, St. Peter's in New Kent County, there's, uh, they, they put a wing on the north side. The same thing at Vauder's Church in Essex County, there's a north wing that's put on, and but there's a chancel door. Um, cruciform churches like Christ Church obviously work in a different way. There's not a chancel door. Um, there are doors into those wings, um, which provided access, but the main entrance, there might be, and what, what I don't know enough about, and, and what we don't know because the documents don't show this up, there might be doors particularly uh, reserved for men and doors for women, uh, especially if they segregated um, seating. Uh, for example, Bruton Parish Church, um, a cruciform church uh, was built in 17 teens. And we know that the women sat on the north side of the nave and the men on the south side. Now, we, what we don't know if men and women in, entered separate doors, this could work. And the reason I say that is because I remember during the Falcons War in 1982, I guess it was, and after it was over, the British sent a new governor to uh, the Falcons, and he made a faux pas of entering the church as a sort of liberation worship service. He entered the woman, the, the, the women's door. He went in the wrong door. And he was, I don't know why I remember this, but uh, that's what happened. So uh, in some very conservative places, that pattern carried on for a long time. Other, other places, and this is why it's hard, because in other Anglican churches, there is, uh, you know, mixed seating of men and women, or it could be uh, rich people, rich men and women either had the honor or the uh, luxury of not s sitting with their spouse. Uh, so it can vary from place to place, which makes it very hard. I wonder what your thoughts are about um, the location where they did the archaeological digging for the original Christ Church. It seems so close to the next church that they would have been building a brick church with scaffolding and all of that right next to a small frame building, maybe even blocking access. Does that? Um, yeah, that's possible. I mean, it, it's hard to tell. We know so little about, you know, uh, the. Um, Earlier, there was a brick church that preceded the present Abington Church, which was built in the 1750s by, um, um, anyway, it was built in 1750s, but the earlier one was, was an 18th, a 17th century brick church. And it, it was probably, mm, now I'm trying to remember, uh, it's been 20 years, but it's probably about 100 yards or less from the present building, but it's in the graveyard. Um, you know, in the, you know, they used obviously, uh, in Jamestown, uh, they used the same site to build the, uh, brick church after the, the frame church. Um, and, you know, in that case, you know, because it was an urban situation, uh, they were constructed for space. The same thing in, in Williamsburg that the, uh, the old church that I showed you is, oh, uh, maybe, 20, 20 yards at most uh, to the north and west of the present building. The present building is basically hugging the lot line uh, down at the, at the southeast corner. Um, so, you know, I can understand why, why in urban situations you don't have a lot of leeway where you can build a new church. 
Um, I don't think the problem, you know, there, you know, I don't think there's a big problem of uh, construction noise and, and that sort of thing since, you know, people are not going to be at the church except maybe once every, you know, Sunday, every one, one week or two weeks. And they're going to be working away, building, you know, uh, five, six days a week and not working on Sunday. So I don't think just the fact you have scaffolding. I think what I learned in my study of Bruton Parish Church is that throughout the 18th century, they probably lived with scaffolding most of the time in that church. Uh, They're always repairing windows, taking down, uh, they're erecting uh, uh, galleries uh, or, or um, moving the furnishings around. Um, so, you know, it just, I don't think it worried them that much. I guess, you know, if it weren't leaking too much, it was okay. When they're, aren't there, and they're, that, I never done the research, but it'd be interesting, Carl, to see how many churches are building new churches on the site versus adjacent based on either archaeology or vestry records, right? I mean, we know, for example, Aquia, when it burns, it talks, of, the Virginia Gazette mentions that the other church north of it or next to it burned. Um, obviously, Bruton had a church near it. Um, and I, I think some of the Christchurch Middlesex, there's discussions about earlier churches, but I've never, you know, assembled all that information. So can we say, are they sometimes, sometimes they're tearing them down and building on the site. Other times they're building adjacent, I guess is safe yeah. to say. Yeah, I think so, Robert. That, that seems reasonable. But yeah, I only wish we knew more, obviously. That's why... <laughs> That's why I'm going to send you all out and raise money to do archaeology and we can <laughs> answer some of these questions. Well, hopefully when we start our rising damp excavations around the building, we may uncover some more clues to that first church because I'm, I'm kind of changing my tune on its location because for me, the burials being where they are, and tell me if this is right or not, but these prominent people being buried are being buried in the chancel of churches it seems like, or on the outside east wall, like Blair is at Jamestown and Clack is at Ware Church, other people like that. So if that's true, those graves at Christ Church predate the brick structure. I just have a hard time believing they would have had those graves of Robert's two wives at the east, at the west door to that first church. Does that make sense? Uh, well, the trouble is, you know, once you're dead, you don't necessarily stop moving. Um, people get dug up and moved around all the time. Um, they move graves. Um, you know, it's it's very interesting to to hear um, uh, John Blair, the uh, James Blair's nephew, John Blair Jr., who who was in charge of expanding Bruton Church in 1751 adding the 25 feet to the east wing of the, uh, the east end of the church and he, he goes in and he realizes that his his young children who died a number of years earlier were uh basically in the construction site and so he had to dig them up and move them uh and they were reinterred in i think inside what would become inside of the church um you know we, we've done so little church archaeology, it's hard to tell um, about, you know, what Grays can and can't tell us about, and also attitudes toward, toward the dead. Um, I, I don't, you know, I, I, we need more, we, we need more evidence, sorry. So yes, it would be fun. I, I can't wait in some respects to, to <laughs> dig up the the, uh, you know, around the church there. I've got another Chapels of Ease question. Um, okay. I think I'm, I've assumed most of those were frame structures, although the one you referenced in Middlesex County, is that the one that's now a brick Methodist church? That's right. Okay. Uh, but most of them were frame, weren't they? Well, most, most churches at any time in the colonial period were wooden. 
<coughs> uh, you know, Middlesex was pretty wealthy and could afford, I mean, in 1714, they, they specify three brick churches at the same time, which is an extraordinary undertaking uh, to, to do that kind of uh, major infrastructure work, I guess, as we call it today. Uh, but do we have doing... much evidence of what the interior of a lot of these chapels of ease was like? I mean, were they fitted out with a communion table and a rail and a three-tier pulpit, or were they much simpler than that? Um, yes, they'd have a communion table and rail. I mean, it'd be, you know, you got to have a communion table, and, and railing was pretty traditional by this time. Uh, a pulpit. Uh, was common. It doesn't have to be. It, it, the, the, the point is is how elaborate it could be. For example, the one at Christ Church in Lancaster, you know, had inlay and, and it's, you know, you've got walnut uh, balusters as opposed to pine balusters. Uh, you know, you got more carving. Um, so what you're putting your money into is, is the elaboration. And that's when I showed you those pulpits from uh, the first quarter of the 17th century, you saw basically something that a joiner could put up, uh, but then you saw some other ones that were highly carved. It, it would cost a lot of money to to, to make those. So uh, my assumption is that they, you know, the the chapel of eases are fairly modest. Thank you. Uh, I found a chapel of ease uh, that no one knew about, I guess the locals knew about it, in Franklin County, uh, again, in this past decade, uh, uh, a doctor from um, uh, Rocky Mount called me up, says, I've got an 18th century church I want you to come look at. And you say, what? You know, you think you know that they're all, um, we've seen them all, but he, uh, you know, my colleague Willie Graham, I went up there and it was a little tiny frame building that was, um, 24 by, let's see, 30, no, 24, anyway, something this small, it's a small wooden building, uh, but it, it was, um, it was described in 1769, it was, it was, you know, they were going to build it, and they did, we did dendrochronology, and in fact, it is 1769, uh, but it, it didn't have any, on you know it didn't have any interiors the, the framing was all exposed on the inside i could see where the pulpit was located um but there was you know the you would have just seen the weather boards once you're inside but you could see all the all the posts they were all exposed they were nice oak posts uh but there was no interior woodwork and until 1950 when the primitive baptists finally decided to put some sheathing on the inside of it. It had been taken over by the Baptists after the, the revolution. And, uh, but they, they perfectly happy with having an unfinished interior for 150 years. And, uh, and uh, they made changes, unfortunately, as late as 1950, or it would have been as it was in, in 1769. Uh, so I can imagine that's, of course, that's, you know, that was, four hours drive from Williamsburg, which would have been what, two weeks or a week and a half from Williamsburg in the 18th century, out in the middle of nowhere uh, on the frontier. Uh, but yet, you know, it had a chancel door. We found the chancel door, it was there and it had the west door. So it, it was all laid out like a, a, a you know, a typical uh, traditional English church, uh, Anglican church, um, but no finishes. So there could have been very simple finishes in, in many of these. But I think in Tidewater, uh, by the late colonial period, you know, there's a lot of wealth here. And so a lot of these chapels of ease um, could well have had nice finishes in, inside them. Carl, didn't they find uh, the building? If there are no more questions. I'm sorry. No, just one, just one quick question that was um, sure. related to Abingdon. Didn't they find the, um, I can't remember his name, but it, didn't they find the builder's name in like a chancery suit from the 19th yes. century? Yeah, James Skelton. 
the guy that actually built the second capital in Williamsburg, he same time he's building uh, Abington Church, the present church, he was building, uh, uh, rebuilding the capital in Williamsburg, 1752-53. But they found they found it because uh, his workmen were suing him for being not being paid, and this case was now by the 1820s. They're still still trying to settle it. His grandchildren are trying to settle it. So, you know, in some in some cases, it's great that things get got get caught up in court cases because then the documents survive. Uh, but those were in loose papers in the in the Chantry loose papers for Gloucester County, um, which is great uh, to, to to actually find who the builder of the church was. Yeah, that's that's a great find. Yeah. Well, uh, thank everyone who participated. Uh, Carl is fountain of font, no pun intended of knowledge, right? But uh, really enjoyed the great questions. And if you haven't seen, if you want to get a view of the roof that that Carl talked about at Christ Church, um, let me see if I can get on here and I will, let me, hold on one second. I'll see if I can get my screen up here. And if you go to our website, ChristChurch1735.org, you'll see a link. Can everyone see that? Yes. Hey, you see the link here for virtual tour? We actually did this before COVID. I uh, just happened to have a, a great grant for it and support from uh, River County's Community Foundation. But if you notice, you can tour all kinds of, you can do all kinds of, uh, movement with it and these little dots or points of interest you can click on but the neat thing is you can actually go up and visit the roof structure which is kind of the holy grail of colonial virginia roof framing i think and it's a neat um really neat view you can see a lot of it is still original even this piece of flashing we think may have been from the first church it has nail holes in it and you can see uh, that King Post trust that Carl talked about. So I'll stop getting you dizzy, but um, explore that if you like. And it's a neat, uh, neat addition to the site. And it, it is extraordinarily tall. It's like 19 feet tall from stand, if you were standing on the uh, top of the vaulting up to the apex of the Right. I mean, you can play badminton in there or volleyball. I mean, there'd be some obstructions, but it, it's it's a gigantic site interior. I mean, my students love it when we get a, get up there. It's a neat space. Well, thanks so much, Carl. Thanks, everyone. If you have more questions, send them on to our info at Christchurch1735.org, and we'll we'll try our best to answer them, and we'll keep everyone updated. We hope to have some archaeology taking place by May, realistically, for the rising damp. And um, we'll keep people posted on our Facebook, on our website. And hopefully we'll find more about that first church. And I'd like to thank everybody for sticking with me and uh, appreciate your questions. They were really great questions. Um, thank you for tuning in. It's always nice to have a captive audience. And Carl shared with me his last Zoom, one of his last Zoom talks, he had um, someone trying to change the slides for him. He also had roofers at his house. So he said in the middle of his talk in the window, he has legs dangling off a ladder and off of a roof and loud music playing. So this was much more Puritan-like, I guess, uh, than, yeah, it was, than what it you was experienced. Yeah, you know, because you know, it, was a, it was a lecture uh, in southern France in, in Aix-en-Provence, so I have all these French and English people, uh, and there's mariachi music being played uh, on the roof of my house, and I saw legs dangling and, and banging away of, of roofers, uh, so it, it was a little bit of a distraction, uh, but that happens. Thank you very much. That happens to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's all right. Well, thanks Thank so you. much. See everybody, and uh, keep in touch, please. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. You're welcome. Glad you could be part of it. Thanks. Sure.
All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. Sounds good, Matt. Thanks.